Okay, we're live. Cool. Welcome, everybody. Hey, hello to everybody who's joining us. <coughs> we went, Ivan. It's not it's just a five minutes, right? Hey, hello to everybody who's joining us. We went yesterday, yesterday to snorkel in the house wreck here yeah? in the heart. I've never been to that place. It's like 45 meter long wreck, but only two meters shallow. Nice. Trying to see the photogrammatory kit. Waiting for the results now. Something that you can do when, when you can't dive, but you can still snorkel on top. You should try, Ivan. If you have, yes, if maybe. There. I'll join the snorkeling group soon. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where's the wreck again, you say? In Mayhard. Mayhard. Oh. Opposite tattoo bar, opposite divers, just oh, there, two, three meter deep. Uh, it's sticking out when it's low tide. Huge. It's been there for 30 years. I never never went there. First time two days yeah. ago. It's really right. big, like more than 40 meters long. <laughs> we do that tomorrow. <clears throat> Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Frankie. Good morning, Andy. I guess uh, maybe, yeah, it's early morning for you, actually, Andy, over there. Gary Grant, good morning. See everybody joining in. Welcome everybody. We're just going to give a little five minutes to let everybody join the room, um, and then we'll start with our with our presentation from the guys. You can see they're there in in Thailand where it's nice and sunny. I'm a, I'm hiding on the inside in the UK. What shades? <laughs> hey everybody. <clears throat> Okay, a couple of people come in. Tamanj from Turkey, Luis from Portugal, Paul Leslie from Australia, uh, Olivier Fayou from Mauritius. We've got Mark from the UK, Nick Koo. Hi, hi guys, how are you all? Hello everyone. Hey guys. So if you're, the, if you're in the right part of the world, grab a coffee. If you're in the other part of the world, grab a beer and join us for the next kind of hour. Well, we talked to the guys uh, a little bit about diving in Kotao, the diving they do around, the, around Thailand in generally, and, uh, and, and the awesome uh, rescue the kids that they did from the Damrhein Cave up in the north of Thailand back in 2018. Okay, we've got three more minutes to go. Is that a hammock I see up there, Miko? Sorry, mate. What? Is that a hammock up there I see behind you? Is that where you is that where you do your resting in sleep? And that's where, yeah, if I misbehave, that's where Krista puts me in the nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some people from Gili Telawan, the Dolomites, Greece. Nice. Oh. Uh, Chris Lee from the Philippines. Hi, hi Chris, how you doing, buddy? Nice to see everybody to widen the weight this morning from around the world. My neighbor is watching too. <laughs> hey, Auntie. Hello, Germany. Poland. Nice. Uh, Philippos from Crete. I was due to be in Crete actually uh, this week or last week. Uh, last week actually, but uh, because of this, we're not, we're not going. Bit of a shame, really. Okay, we've got Alex Was from the UK. Virginia from Belgium. Greetings from Amsterdam. Guys, there's are people from all around the world here. We've got 127 people so far. Amazing. Oh, dear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because you're a film star nowadays, Miko. That's why, yeah? Huh? Uh, I better be on my best behavior now. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, Pasi. Welcome to the group. Cool. We've got plenty of people joining. Okay, guys, just so you know, we are now at more than 130, so we beat the Scuba Sunday guys. XR, more popular recreational diving. <laughs> 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 okay right on okay it's 11 here in the uk uh 12 cet and i guess that's 5 p.m in uh thai time so we all can right. start okay gentlemen it's nice to see you all um we'll start with a few introductions um my name is adam wood i'm the itd for uh xr or ssi and i'm here today to to speak to you guys um about what the kind of diving you do in Katao and in Thailand. So if you just want to um, introduce yourself, kind of your name, age, where you're from, and where's home and your current day job. Uh, Mikko, would you like to start? Okay, yeah, my name is Mikko Pasi. come from, from Finland originally. Uh, I'm 45 years old today. And then and, uh, currently, well, I'm a technical instructor, explorer, I'd like to call myself. Uh, currently, I'm living here in the beautiful kingdom of Thailand. And then, then my day job is variates a lot kind of but i'm running running kota divers and uh dive school in in thailand and uh, we got a little chapter in malta and uh, i do diving as my job all sorts of it ivan okay yeah i'm uh, ivan karadic uh, i'm uh, from uh, denmark half danish half serbian i'm 46 years old and uh, my uh, day job is uh, being a ssi xr instructor trainer so uh, that's what I do full time. And your current home is Thailand as well, right? Yes, yes. My current home is Koh Tao, Thailand. Same place as, as Miko. But, okay, cool. Like um, 300 meters away now. <laughs> <laughs> you guys maybe should have used one screen. Yeah. <laughs> wait, I'll be there. <laughs> uh, no, wait, lockdown. You need to stay one two meters apart. <laughs> <laughs> Got that. Okay. Um, for the guys who are watching this in the feed, if you want to type us some questions to ask to Miko and Ivan as we go along, please do so. Um, I'll try and get to as many as we can during the during the chat. Um, and if there's some that um, that don't quite fit in, we'll wait till the end and we'll we'll maybe answer those at the end or in the comments. So, um, when Ivan, uh, how old were you when you started diving? And then again, how old were you when you started teaching diving? Well, I can't remember, but I remember the years. <laughs> it was in 2007. <laughs> I don't know how old I was there, uh, 30 something. 2007, I became an open water diver. And then uh, a year later, I was a, a diving instructor. So uh, so my, my start into diving was like many, I got introduced on a holiday to scuba diving. And uh, obviously seen in 2020 hindsight, I, uh, I totally fell in love with scuba diving and took it up as a profession since 2007. Okay, and, and it was it was it the goal? Did you start diving to become an instructor, or did you start diving for fun? No, I I, I came to to this island Kotao, where I live today, and uh, I was here pretty much randomly, and uh, got introduced to to scuba diving in the form of a open water course. And uh, no, there was absolutely no plans, but but the plans quickly started to to form after my my course when I then went back to Denmark. Um, I I could feel that yeah, scuba diving needed to be a bigger part of my life, and. Uh, and originally, my idea was to take a gap year, maybe a year, half a year, become a diving instructor, then back to my previous job. But uh, yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mika, Mika, how about you, buddy? When when, when did you start diving? Uh, I was I was ninety four in in Turkey, and uh, I still remember it was a it wasn't an SSI course for sure because uh, I was thrown in like. Hmm four times with uh, three three out of four times with an empty tank <laughs> there was no theory back in the days but uh slowly slowly i uh, I, I fell in love with the with the marine life and, and stuff and then uh, then i uh, the, the real buck hit me hit me in 98 uh, when i when i was accepted to a uh, long, one year long uh, instructor course in uh, in oyama mine in Finland, and we we literally we dive the fuck out of the excuse. <laughs> I dived a lot in the, in the in the mine, like 300 dives in that mine, and uh, that's also where my like uh, where the overhead environment diving kicked in for me too. Back in the days, we we didn't do much of the penetrations in the in the mine mine tunnels, but uh, we visited the first first few chambers, and uh, uh, I got my wings instructor wings then after that year, and. Uh, um, 
I met my certifier Imi Wallin just briefly in Malta and she reminded me that I pretty much left the next day after I got my certification papers uh, to Thailand and uh, to build a, build a career over here and uh, and then done. the rest is history. Oh, you, had a, you had a job to go to in Thailand or you just pick your stuff and, had, and, and, and off you went? I had, a, I had, a, I didn't really know any divers when I started my instructor because everybody was laughing at me like what do you think you're doing and, and uh, but I just decided that I will this is what I want and uh, and uh, turned out to be a good decision but I I knew one guy Harry Hartan and uh, back in the days he ran a dive school in Shalong Bay in Phuket and uh, and he accepted me as an instructor and that was my first job in Phuket but but I couldn't stand that place for more than a year and then uh, then I was actually on my way to Australia to 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 continue the career but I stopped on this beautiful island of Kotao and uh, I never been to Australia I kind of got stuck here and uh, which is great uh, set up the dive school and uh, and uh, still doing it okay 20, cool. 20, 25 years awesome so we've got a couple of little questions that kind of relate at the moment so um why is Kotao such a place to dive is it because of the, the the life on the shore or is it because of the life in the water that's one of the questions that we've got from one of their comments I well, think one of one one of the things that is attractive to for divers to Kotao is the ease it is probably one of the easiest place to dive we have very warm water between 28 and 30 degrees generally incredibly good visibility and and very little current so it's a it's a very nice place for for the absolute beginners and that's also the the vast majority of of uh, dive centers they cater to to the beginners so open water advanced and and so on and um, then we have a a large uh, pro uh, business on Kotao so lots of people myself included uh, has our uh, will become instructors on Kotao I see. And it's beautiful. It's the tropics, full of beautiful fish. <laughs> and <laughs> I'd say a couple of words about the, the community over here too. That plays a big role for people to to uh, uh, why why it became such a destination. I think uh, it's fairly far. It's like seventy k's from the mainland, and uh, there's no airport over here. The closest airport is uh, next island Koh Samui, which is also uh, over thirty kilometers away. So. If you want to get here, you need to go come with the boat and uh, you need to do a little bit more extra effort. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the, 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 uh, the population or the expat community over here is fairly young and travel minded. And, uh, and that, that created a great loving community that we, we've been sharing for a couple of decades now. And uh, that also affects to the, to the um, uh, how Kotao is seen and uh, what attracts people over there. But that's not diving, that's outside from diving yeah obviously i joined you guys there in december and it's a, obviously a beautiful island but one of the things i noticed it's not so much of a party island as the other islands there is obviously you know good nightlife there but it, it is focused around people diving and and you know that kind of community spirit a lot more than, it, than some of the other islands it, it has that sporty sport island uh, uh, kind of that we got and up and, uh, yep, it's more outdoors, outdoor sports and I haven't said entry level is the, the biggest biggest thing that we have. Okay, cool. Also, so maybe, guys, maybe add to that. Uh, right. Oh, sorry, no, go on. And I'm, no, continue, Mika. No problem. I got nothing. You go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, obviously, uh, you guys are affected by the lockdown as well. Not only because there's no tourists can travel to your island, but I believe that you guys are also kind of keeping social distancing from each other. How's that affecting your guys' uh, businesses and your lives in Thailand at the moment? Well, for obvious reason, not having any customers have a <laughs> dramatic effect on our business as, <laughs> as our <laughs> income is a big income. Zero. <laughs> uh, so uh, economically, it's it's uh, it's devastating. Yeah, now it's been about six weeks, and and looks like it's going to be another six weeks before any of the <clears throat> restrictions are eased up. So yeah, it's uh, it's not great uh, financially. But as Miko also mentioned before, we have a great community on this island and um, there is definitely pe people on this island that are in need of help. And it's great to see that there are so many uh, people willing to help. So, yeah, it's affected us. We don't see each other as much as we did six weeks ago because, uh, 
you kind of not allowed to assemble anywhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think and for some Miko's, people, that's great. <laughs> Miko's enjoying the quiet time on his own. I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Finally, well, it's it's, it's good good sides. So of course, I can you get to play with your daughter much more, and uh, and and your wife too, and uh, and uh, you're gonna get used to this. But but it is de devastating for for the business, and uh, there's really no nobody knows for how long will it take that tourism will come back to what it was or if it ever will and uh, that is as a as a self-employed or uh, as running a company it's, 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 a, it's something that you can't just uh, overlook but uh, no, for sure. I'm a positive I... with this and I'm sure it, it will, be, will it will come back and people can't stop diving so uh, we're in a good in that way no I think you're right and what I'm seeing from the diving community who are you know a little bit more adventurous I say prepared to travel they, they are looking to support your guys kind of business as soon as they can get back to it um, one of the comments we've got from one of their um, feeds is that somebody's planning to come to, uh, in to no, they were planning to come in 2019 and they came in December 2019 actually do you think they'll be able to visit your island again in August Yes, so the, the, the latest we have from the Thai government is that flights will be allowed to, to land in, in our international airports again uh, from uh, May 31st. Okay. So if that, if that promise or that prognosis keeps, yes, then in August we should be back to business. But nobody really knows. That. The financial with, with, the, yeah, with the customer, everybody's losing jobs, it's not only, only us over here, so uh, it will take time. But uh, for, uh, yeah, I would, I would say the same that I definitely ought to. We are up and running, but on a on a very slow pace. Okay, awesome. So yeah, it's good to know that you guys are prepared for business when it arrives back, and it looks like the diving community is trying to support you guys when you do open. So let's hope that when things kind of chill out a little bit, the floodgates open and we can all get back to work. So, I uh, Miko, can you tell me what kind of diving do you do for fun? What's a fun dive for Miko Pakarai? <coughs> well, uh, anything that involves water. Uh, um, I kind of a, I'm kind of a, like a all-terrain diver. I kind of consider myself like from from cold water to warm water to caves and mines and wrecks and anything anything that there is uh, really really uh, suits me. And uh, I travel quite a lot for different destinations and uh, try to keep my skills up for for being able to dive in cold and cold, cold and warm. Um, but uh, what really triggers me is all kind of projects and expeditions. That is something that I, that's my, my passion is, uh, is out there to, to do something underwater, uh, not just diving, but uh, I mean, some kind of a task to do. And that's where I'm, where I'm, uh, where I'm uh, on my own. That's, that's really what I, what I like to do. And uh, that's what we do actually here with, with Ivan and the rest of our team. We, we look, we search and, and uh, try to locate lots of wrecks and uh, and even some caves and stuff so we're always on the move and that really triggers triggers me uh i always carry also my camera with me which is uh which is a kind of diving itself with the camera and that's that's my passion another passion on top of the exploration is uh is trying to document the export wherever we've been and uh, try to bring it out out to the surface because not everybody can get to those places or can even dive. And uh, I hope that will kind of uh, motivate people, inspire people to get on, get on this port and, uh, and then, then join us. Yeah, on that same day, and I think I'll take the chance to, um, to, to congratulate you on your recent induction into the Explorers Club, I believe. So, yeah, it's not really official yet, but I heard about it too. And uh, yeah, that, that's a big step for being a member now, international member. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting new projects through that and i'm pretty sore proud of it awesome well done man ivan what kind of diving keeps makes you makes you uh, tick mate what what do you what do you like to dive well i think I, I, any any diving is is great for me but uh, the grass is always green on the other side uh, and one thing that we don't have access to here on on this little island is proper caves so when i get a chance to to go to the mainland uh, here in thailand where we have a lot of of cave systems and travel in Southeast Asia, where the cave diving is, is fairly new compared to where you were sitting. And that's probably my, my favorite diving, getting out to, to caves and ideally caves that have not yet been explored. Uh, that really gets me thick there. Yeah, it's awesome. 
Yeah, no, I joined you in December, obviously, to to dive some caves on the mainland. We had a fantastic time. What a what an yeah. awesome experience. Another question we've got from our nice to rescue you. <laughs> yeah. You guys had to rescue each other for the course. Sorry, it was fun. <laughs> um, one of the questions we've got is, has the marine life changed much since the Corona event on Katal? Have you seen a change to the marine life yet when you've been snorkeling and kind of looking from the piers? Oh, that's got to be Nico. He's been snorkeling. I haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just about to say, how would, we, how would we know because we're not allowed to die? <laughs> <laughs> From my but, uh, I, adventure. <laughs> I, I think I think it has changed. We are not there for sure. That's a big change. Yeah, for starters. But uh, um, yeah, I, I hear I hear these stories about Phuket, like uh, turtles coming back on the beach and, and nesting nesting and uh, and uh, what was it the the sea cows dugons they are now now coming in groups closer to the islands and all that stuff. Uh, a dugon or a turtle doesn't make I mean, grow up in a month that we've been off from the sea. So they've been somewhere out there doing their own thing. But now they're coming closer to the to the islands and to the beaches, which is great. The numbers are not changed yet, I would say. But uh, but it, uh, but they, yeah, the big 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 fish and the, and the little fish they they are coming closer to the dive size and uh, taking their homes back. But um, yeah, I think it's all all good, and I really look forward to going back in there and, and seeing it and. Uh, and, uh, but at the moment, yeah, can't really tell because I haven't really been on the dive sites. I noticed you guys, you guys at Kotar Dive did some good work the other day by removing a lot of trash from the from the other side of the island, which is a bit more difficult to access. Run. Yeah, I guess you're helping with the with, with helping the turtles uh, get on the get on the beach and stuff. So that's really really good activity, mate. Well done. Okay, uh, it's amazing how much fish there is, and it comes from the rivers, and it then comes to the seas, and uh, then these these beaches are just clean up there are uh, actually Oli and friends they clean up we just pick up the trash to be honest but still uh um yeah the, the, the garbage is the, the rubbish is not from from us from the island it's, it's yeah it's from the rivers and it's from the seas but it's a it's devastating amount that there is just one isolated 20 meter long beach we could pick up 30 big bags of rubbish and still is understand if you start to dig there's there's plenty more so i'm sure the turtle like that mm, good man well done ivan um, side mounts becoming extremely popular around the world and especially you know now in Thailand can you give me a bit of an insight into how it's developing in Thailand and um, what's available for the traveling side mount diver well yeah so uh, yeah I, I agree side mount is, is, is spreading uh, quickly you know um, we've been doing side mount here in Kotao since when we start 2009 2010 or something uh, we started with side mount and back then it, it was incredibly rare to see guests coming and uh, request any kind of side mount. Uh, we obviously have uh, quite a lot of equipment for training and that equipment is also available for, for rental. So so while maybe a bit in the past it's been very hard to be a traveling side mount diver because you would need to bring pretty much everything. Uh, now you see at, at, at our dive center and, and also some of our competition, that you can get access to uh, the dedicated sideman equipment, dedicated sideman tanks, um, and I think that's great to see that that now that uh, that people can can go and and get get their sideman needs uh, uh, supplied by by dive centers. And we see here in Asia and Thailand specifically, we see a lot of dive centers, uh, also dive centers that have uh, little or no interest in in technical diving. They 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 use it for their recreational customers. So. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's definitely a, something that is very popular here in Asia. Okay, cool. Uh, Miko, a question we've got is: What's the main difference or benefits between recreational diving and side mount diving? Obviously, you know, you and me know that recreational diving can be done on side mount, but like, what's the kind of the, the main benefits for for a diver over a say, let's say a single tank on their back? Well, well, we've got redundancy, of course thing that is, is much more safer once you got the got the, the double tanks over there um, uh, then uh, I'm always wondering why the way that tanks should be on the back anyways because there's lots of lots of leaks and things that can go wrong with the valves and stages and stuff uh, so uh, to have to have uh, to have the tanks on your underneath your armpits and just easy check all the bubbles and and if there's any leaks and uh, and uh, that adds a lot of a lot of safety safety there already think that much better having 
lower coin with, with the tanks on your side. Uh, this bunch of, there's lots of, lots of, lots of benefits compared to the, the single back mount and even, even double back mounted divers. And, uh, and uh, side mount is, is like, it's for caves. Like it used to, it, it come from the cave background, but uh, the benefits with safety and trim and, and uh, will be, will, uh, they don't change if you come out from the cave. They also, also benefit from, from in the open, open sea. So, uh, I would recommend it straight straight to any kind of diving, pretty much. Uh, unless you're doing a lot of lot of work underwater and stuff, because you it automatically trims you in a in a horizontal position and uh, and uh, not doesn't allow you to do certain certain tricks that back mount allows you to. Um, yes, that. that <laughs> Nico, you know I love you, buddy. Can you take your pen and throw it over your shoulder for me? <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Don't. dude. <laughs> 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 okay, Ivan. Um, tell me, man. Um, using standard valves for side mount, you know, it's kind of a reality for a lot of divers. How do you? How do they go about doing that? Is that something that you, you know, it can be done easily? Do you guys offer normal valves as well as side mount valves, or, you know, what's the reality when you start to travel with side mount? Well, yeah. So, so that is that's still very, very common today that you will see many dive centers that offer side mount, but they don't have dedicated valves. And to be totally honest, the best thing is to do it with dedicated valves. But I probably did my first hundred or two hundred side mount dives in non-dedicated valves, and it's it's fully doable. But but uh, for a dive center, I would say the investment in a few extra valves, depending on the customer base, is so little, and it does add. Uh, both safety and it is the right way to do it. Uh, a valve compared to all the other uh, equipment, all the other investment, it's it's a very little investment. So, uh, so I hope to see more and more dive centers investing in that. Alternatively, the diver can buy their own uh, valves. You know, they don't weigh that much, a few kilo each, and then you can travel with your valves and then ask the dive center to to mount them on the tanks, and in that way you will get access to to the perfect equipment and. Um, but to be totally honest, if, if, if you're going on a Simon holiday and, and there's no access to these valves, you'll be just fine. You'll be just fine. It takes some adaption. You need to mount the tank slightly different, but that's something that you should be uh, informed <clears throat> of, of in doing your dive training. So, so yes, I, I prefer to have dedicated valves, but if they're not available, don't sweat you'll be just fine cool and Miko, you seen integrated now with recreational diving more Are the, you know you've seen the boats go out with mixed rec mixed single tank divers and side mount divers on the same boat or are they kind of staying to to slightly uh, more more xr type boats no it's all integrated of course uh, i mean if you do recreational diving or technical diving then then you separate the boats because the, the dive times are way longer with the which you can do with side mount which is one of the benefits too but but uh, we got lots of side mount recreational guys on our on our daily boats with us with the, with this with the single tank guys, and it's just just more gas actually because you don't need to leave that tank the, 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 the one third of the first dive's tank and throw it away because you can you can actually use it on the second dive. You're still diving the same tanks. Um, it's a um, it's a bit 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 of a struggle on the boat, of course. <laughs> Unless you jump in with the, with the tanks and get the tanks later, but uh, other than that, time makes perfect. They, they go well together, better than once again twin tanks, uh, I would say. Because like Ivan just said, yeah, you can use the same tanks even with the with the right hand valves instead of having them uh, dedicated side mount valves. But of course, we do have the dedicated side mount valves in the shop. Cool. Now, one of the things I was really lot, and I very welcome. One of the one of the things I was really uh, nice to see when I was with you recently was uh, you're also using your side mount with your rebreather. Uh, so I know you've got a no, new cool toy. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about how you configure your new rebreather with your side mount? Ah, uh, well, yeah, that's that's. I, I've been uh, since since I started rebreather diving. I've been I've been specializing on side mount rebreathers, and uh, and uh, I'm always always fascinated about having the machine under your arm because of even for water, once again, you can be much more streamlined and you can do your finish your deco on the line while people are paddling, trying to keep up with the current if there's any any, any around, but you still steam around. And, uh, um, yeah, I dive a machine, SF2, you can actually, it is both, it's Did we lose Miko?
It looked like it. It's a good picture of him. He seems, he seems <laughs> in the right oh. way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ivan. Uh, let's let's come back to you for a minute and see if we get Miko back in a moment. Um, obviously, everybody's aware Thailand's really awesome place for for recreational diving. But um, developing since the last kind of ten years is a place for XR technical diving. Can you give me a little bit of insight into what kind of XR diving is available in Thailand and, and in Kotao in general? Well, it, it obviously depends a little bit. So Thailand dive wise, you can easily split in a uh, east coast. And the west coast. So we are on the east coast, Kotao, and the west coast, uh, you will have Phuket, uh, Kolanta, which is also famous, PP, and so on and so forth. So the west coast have fairly deep water. It's easy to surpass 100 meters. You go on a boat, uh, half an hour later, you are a dive uh, spot where you can get all the depth you like. And that's obviously their focus on the, on the west coast. They, they do a lot of trimix, deep trimix, stuff like this, because they have uh, that kind of uh, diving. All the caves, as I mentioned before, they are on the mainland. We don't, unfortunately, have any caves here in Kotao. So you will find them on, in the south of Thailand, and you'll find them uh, in the north, and you'll find them uh, just uh, west of Bangkok. Um, I think I might have... <laughs> what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just talk about what kind of XR dives are available for people to do in Thailand, you know? Yes. Is, there, is so, there some so, kind of wrecks or caves? You know, what are, what are the yeah. specialisms people can do? So, so our two uh, major focuses are, are wreck and caves. So as I said before, and I, I guess many people know today, that, that we have some, some caves in Thailand, some of them very famous, uh, Tham Luang being one of them. Not a great place to scuba dive, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and in the south of Thailand, where, where we live, here we have plenty of caves, anything from small caves, 100 meters roofs to massive systems that will take you weeks, if not years, to, to fully explore. Then we have wrecks. We have the, especially here in the Gulf of Thailand, where Kotao is, there was during the Second World War, there was massive uh, naval battles between the Japanese and the Allied forces on the other side. So we have an estimated of 450 World War II wrecks uh, in the Gulf of Thailand and less than 30 or so have been found. The vast majority are, are uh, merchant shipping uh, that, uh, that got sunk. So yes, if you like a uh, wreck diving, um, as I said, there's probably still 400 wrecks out there that are yet to be discovered. Myself and uh, Miko went in 2017, I think it was. Uh, we, we actually found one of these uh, big uh, Japanese merchant ship, a, a, a boat called uh, Burma Maru that was uh, sunk in, I think, 42 or 43 or something like that. Um, and that's quite all awesome to get out and see. And they, they, these wrecks are pristine. They are untouched. They've been there with, with no humans uh, for the last 70, 75 years. So uh, they're quite uh, stunning, full of marine life, visibility, uh, where we find these wrecks are generally 40 plus. So it's it's some astonishing dives. Yeah. You see a beautiful wreck, lots of history, and then sharks, whale sharks, whales, and tropical fish everywhere it's a it's a great dive okay oh so we talked a little bit there about the uh the, the case system for the north of thailand um, i'm gonna ask you guys now so miko welcome back by the way um if you could yeah. tell me a little bit about um the rescue of the wild boars football team how how did your own diving prepare you for that well it's probably it all starts from there with my mindset and uh how i got hooked to overhead environment diving um but um i think uh, all, all the experience like you dive a long time it creates a certain mind that you can you can push 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 away those feelings and uh, if you're deep inside and doing a doing a doing a rescue operation like that there is no time to time for um, a place for uh, hesitation or or any emotion so to say and uh, that partially comes from from uh, from uh, from years of years of experience of diving in general um don't know why uh, also probably it was a long operation so uh um was thinking like how i mean long days and and uh, in in the uh, in the northern thailand and also the, the climatizing because we live here in thailand so we know no kind of uh, how hard and how humid and uh what kind of issues in general staying in the jungle and like that long and uh, so also the fact that uh we are living living the area or Thailand in general and, and uh, access to the water. So we got a hell of a routine all the time. We can dive every day many times if if that's the case. And uh, all that kind of prepares you to you to it. But uh, when it came to the actual rescue, nothing 
prepared to you to that. That was all pretty much a lot of improvising over there and uh, and then just go out and do it as it comes. Okay, awesome. Ivan, can you give an idea what were the conditions like when you guys arrived to the cave and what were the conditions like for the actual rescue part? So the conditions outside the cave was, it actually reminded me most like a, like a music festival. Yeah, lots of mud, lots of tents and thousands of people walking around and it looked quite chaotic from the outside. And then after a few minutes, five, 10 minutes, you start to find out that there's actually uh, there's actually some some order in all the madness. So the outside was confusing. Loads of people. I'm talking about thousands, four or five thousand people. Um, inside the cave, the conditions in that, there were, were even worse. Um, the the water condition was like like uh, You couldn't see anything. So uh, pretty poor visibility. Um, in the early days, before I actually went in and did the diving in there. Uh, the the flow inside the cave from from inside to outside the cave was uh, severe. Um, when we started diving, it wasn't that bad, but visibility was uh, measured in centimeters. Hmm. And 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 Miko, what what? It's a lot of mud and rocks there. I guess there's sharp rocks and kind of lots of um, change of depth and passage. Um, was it particularly hard place to navigate in? No, it's kind of straightforward cave to be honest it's, it's about five kilometers in length but in, in total with everything is measured to be third, the third longest cave system in thailand with overall length in 10 uh, around about 10 kilometers uh the navigation inside was pretty straightforward some to some and chamber to chamber but uh but yeah the the, the hard rocks and stuff it, it wasn't easy 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 going in even to the the, the sort of the the, the first non-divable non-diving 800 meters to the chamber three was uh, was a struggle with uh, with uh, with all the equipment to carry and you have to you have to climb up some parts and then slide down and uh, do a little couple of dives and uh, I remember I was in I was the first two days with dry suit there because I, I came from Malta and I didn't know how cold the water is and how long days we're gonna do over there and stuff like that so so I put a dry suit on. Uh, the, the days inside the cave they were 10, 10 hour long so you will hypothermia with the with the three mil long suit or uh, so I, I choose the, the dry suit but um, then um, I gave up after two days with the dry suit because it was like a heat stroke when you when you were walking the walking part part of it the first two hours and then you start diving and your 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 dry suit is full of sweat and uh, it was all right for the diving part but then the, then the sharp rocks and stuff like that uh, was well, the dry suit was like shot with the shotgun <laughs> when, I, when I came back. It didn't have a hole, it had like 100 holes. And that was only two days with it. But uh, I swapped then to, uh, to another, another, another thick, two, um, uh, thick uh, dry suit, uh, uh, wetsuit for the rest of the journey. But uh, the navigation, not that hard, except once we started from the chamber three towards the chamber nine, nobody has been there. <laughs> Nobody had any cameras to show us how it looks. Well, nobody saw it because it was so murky, and it was that kind of. It was hard to navigate in a, in a way that, as a, within the team, we were talking about like, okay, you guys, next next job is to bring these stage tanks to a uh, chamber number five, and uh, nobody's been. Nobody knows what is chamber number five. We had very old map, and but you couldn't really tell. It all looks the same. The chambers weren't that big and spectacular that you could tell which chamber was what and we literally were the first on, on the second day that we didn't have any idea how the cave looked so so uh, there was a lot of a lot of uh, difficulty to tell to to decide what is actually chamber five what is actually chamber six seven and so on so forth so uh, in that way uh, it was kind of a hard we, we learned every day a lot and by the in the end of the week we we knew exactly what is what but it was really hard to to um to make a map where everybody understands that which chamber is what and that mm. there we went did a little mistakes but luckily not not bad enough nothing too bad okay ivan what was the biggest challenge for you actually um as part of that rescue what was your personal biggest challenge i think miko mentioned it uh, uh in the start yeah that was actually the, the walk into the first dive there was about what was it 800 900 meters walk from from the entry of the cave to the to chamber three where we actually started diving 
and uh, the physical challenge and carrying 20 kilos of equipment to a muddy cave in obviously a very bad lighting, muddy everywhere, slippery. And there were places where if you fell down, you, you, you are not coming up again immediately. So that was, that was physically incredible challenge. I remember the first time we did the, the, the trip in there, it took me a good 45 minutes of, of rest before I, I felt ready to actually start the, the diving here. So uh, actually before the diving, that was the hardest part. So it's taking you two hours to cover that 800 meters, yeah? 90 Very minutes or something, it was, it, 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 it's, it's incredibly hard to move in any speed inside a cave. You, you are swimming, crawling, jumping, and carrying uh, excess equipment. So, yeah, it was, uh, I think it took about 90 minutes to get in there. Cool. Wow. Well, it sounds like, a, sounds like a hell of a physical challenge. It what was. <laughs> for, for me, for me the, the challenge with the, with the whole operation was, was, uh, was not the physical part, but the, I remember when we sit with Ivan and, and the rest of the Euro team, the night before we were, we started the extraction of the kids. And then we were asked, like last time, like, so, so you're up to it, you can still walk away uh, or you can go, but to, to accept the, the, the uh, responsibility of moving those kids around in the cave without no, uh, no uh, legal, how do you say, uh, liability. And, uh, and uh, to really say yes, to go there, because if, if, if and we were assuming that things will go wrong, that we, that people will stay there or there will be bodies and uh, and uh, to ex ex accept that risk that you will have to live with that sort of a thing the rest of your life and you might risk your business over here and uh, and uh, what if it happens on your watch and stuff like that and I remember when we were sitting in, in that table it was quite quiet over there and we all did took that risk and accept those uh, what, what might happen and uh, that that was the hardest part for me not and then of course the physical after that but that was really, really what well, what get me. But thank God we made the decision on that table, and we didn't think about it in the rest of the operation anymore. Yeah, no, I think um, the outcome that you guys got was spectacular, um, and and the dedication of the team and everybody being able to put aside all of their uh, you know their own um, their own anxiousness to be able to get the job done was was what made it so successful. So yeah, again, congratulations. How has being involved in the rescue changed your uh, your life, and how has it changed your diving? So Ivan, if you want to answer that first, what's oh, changed your life? I don't know. You know, it's I've been doing stuff that I probably wouldn't have done if, if we hadn't been a part of this. Uh, been invited to events like you were doing today and and similar events. Talked a lot about uh, the cave rescue. Um, it's now what two years ago almost. So so it's it's not in the in the mainstream news anymore. But I remember immediately after the cave rescue, you know, here in Thailand specifically, uh, you got stopped on the street, you went to 7-Eleven, people, oh, you're the guy that did this. So, so it's opened a lot of doors uh, to go and talk about the, the rescue and talk about uh, diving in, in general. I don't know if it's changed uh, the way I dive. Uh, I don't think so. Not not diving wise because to be honest the, 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 the diving in Tam Long was probably the the, the, the least uh, challenge up there the, the real challenge was the cooperation working with so many nationalities different professions different ideas of how to to, uh, to complete this rescue I learned a lot from the interpersonal inter uh, communication between different groupings different opinions different cultures religions whatever. Uh, so I learned a lot from that. Diving wise, not so much. Not so much. Miko, how about you, dude? What's changed in your life since you did it? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, what Ivan said is for the for the life changing. Uh, of course, of course, it's changed changed a little bit. And uh, what I'm really thankful is I met get to meet these these amazing divers and characters and uh, in the in the operation and after that and and uh, and once again got got more project in my calendar which is great so i get to dive more <laughs> and uh but uh, as, a, as a diver uh it changed me like like uh, the confidence that you get from being able to uh take a part in such a big operation and and uh, help 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 the other divers in the in the in the rescue um you kind of you kind of put your like in in diving in general you're, you're not supposed to push your limits uh inch by inch minute by minute uh you you can push your limits a bit in in a in a, in a safe environment and stuff like this but now we had we were in the in the environment 
in a situation that I never imagined or, or dreamed of, uh, to be. And uh, I had to push my limits in, in my endurance and in, with equipment and with, with, with uh, all, had to throw all the, all the cave diving rules out the window and, and uh, do solo and, and uh, stuff like this. But we had a great, we had a, one of the best motive, motivation or motives to do with, which was the football team in the end of the cave. And uh, since we did that for a week of the diving in there and, and, uh, and we managed to, to finish the job that kind of, I get, I gain a lot of confidence to my own diving because I, I got to push my limits and I still don't know where the limits are, but I know, know now that I could do that. And that is something that is a kind of a shortcut that you take when you, when you, when you have a, when you can be in a, um, involved in operation like this. And that's, that's something that I take away from there. Uh, confidence for the team, work confidence for the for the equipment. Uh, <laughs> you should have seen a places the equipment where and where we fix them in the dark, in the mud and the water, blah blah blah. They, they still work, and the personal confidence that you get that actually you can do that. You can do pretty much anything. And uh, I'm not going to test myself again soon, but that's something that I <laughs> that I got yeah. from there. Let's hope there's no reason you need to test yourself again soon, boys. You get to just sit, sit, sit on your little pretty <laughs> island for a while. Um, but. Um, Obviously, equipment was a big part of what you did. You know, you guys wrecked some equipment, you know, threw your own stuff at the project. And um, the, some of the diving industry came together to, to kind of give you guys some more equipment to sponsor you with, the, with, with that products, that kind of stuff. So, you know, what, what kind of help did you guys get from the diving community? And, you know, what's your favorite piece of equipment now? <laughs> okay, I go. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a story about my favorite piece of equipment. That was the side mark rebreather that I had over there. And uh, I think it was, was it the day before we were supposed to for the extraction? We are we are sitting in the in the bungalow area, and uh, there comes a truck, and uh, my my uh, my side mount rebreather with my my XD wing is there, and the truck comes and drives straight over the whole whole uh, <laughs> side mount <laughs> rebreather and the wing, and I'm like, oh my god, that just happened, and and that and that, then it just drives off, and one of one of the Thai guys uh, he ran after the. The truck driver stopped him and tried to explain that you, you, you just drive over a rebreather that is supposed to be used to get the children out tomorrow. And you should see the guy's face. <laughs> okay. Talk about the equipment. Uh, that breather, it's made from fiberglass. It, it didn't take a scratch. It, it didn't miss a beat. It, it still worked. And so did the, so did the, the XD wing that I used. They worked perfectly the next day. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that was something about the equipment. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, what was the question in general? Like, so yeah, so obviously you got some support from the equipment the, manufacturers and kind of what's your favorite piece of equipment? Yeah, that was the, that was the other favorite piece of my equipment. But uh, you always need to have a tool for the right job. And uh, I used that for the first two days in the operation. But then when we started to extract the kids, when you need to dive with the, with the, with the children, they might wake up, da, 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 da. you're in a rescue mode. You don't use uh, CCR anymore. You, you go for open circuit. So I swapped for the last three days for my another favorite equipment, which is the basic open circuit side mount. And uh, that was a that was an awesome tool. Everybody, everybody was using it over there. Uh, but uh, outside from the equipment, I would say my camera is also another tool that I really love. <laughs> it's always with me on the on end of every dive. Like over a big, to you, I big, S, big SLR type, Miko, or are we talking a small camera? What what's the best thing to carry around when you're when you're outside mount diving is this and um, is that that's a that's a gopro and that's a big bro <laughs> that's a, <laughs> it's a olympus omri uh five em something five uh yeah. digital slr camera with uh, with the eight millimeter fish eye it's very small you can carry it with you everywhere and, and when you're uh, when you're outside mount diving where do you clip it where do you put it out the way on the on your on your butt ring or on the front here you should see my dome, it's scratched like hell all the time. I just put it here and I don't really take good care of it, but it still, it still works perfectly. It never leaked for two years old now. And uh, it's just an awesome tool with me. This is the other one that I'm using now. You see it? Uh, Sidewinder, uh, nice. Sidewinder. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I said, every, I mean, tool for each job. So deep diving with, with, with the proper CCR, electronics and stuff like this then if you want to go long and shallow sidewinder might be it the camera i need to upgrade because it stops at 100 meter now i need to get new springs <laughs> ivan <laughs> go ahead man what what you know what was the uh, the help from the manufacturers like and you know what's your favorite piece of equipment 
Well, uh, my favorite piece of equipment. I don't really know if I have anything, but it's it's probably my PCD. I have a, an XT uh, Tech PCD that was uh, kindly donated by XT themselves. I think you saw Mikos uh, just before, and it's something that I've been doing. You know, I started Sidemon ten years ago, and I pretty much do all my dives in Sidemon. So it's a big part of my my day, and it's a it's a excellent equipment. I also have a camera. I have one of those uh, cameras, uh, underwater camera called a Paralens, which I use a lot in my, my training. I film my students when they complete their skills. We use it for a, for a um, debriefing and so on. So so both of those things are, are big. But, but to be totally honest, uh, it's equipment. It's, it's, uh, it's tools for my, my trade. I'm, I'm not so... Uh, uh, I'm sure if I've never tried the X-Deep and I've been diving in something else, that would be my favorite. But... Uh, I'm very happy for, for the equipment I have, yeah. Go ahead, Miko. Did we lose Miko again? If they match, please, Ivan and me, scooters, scooter, DPVs, please. <laughs> please send us DPVs, yeah? <laughs> <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> no worries, I'll get, uh, we'll get, we'll speak to some guys, even get you guys some, some scooters. Um, now, uh, we talked a little bit about side mount harnesses there. Do you think you to dive side mount you need the dedicated side mount harnesses, or you know some of the other styles? Do they work, or is it kind of the same thing again? Tool for a job. No, no. When it comes to 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 uh, the BCD uh, for your side mount diving, you you absolutely have to go for a dedicated one. Um, the the times where it's okay to to do side mount in a back mount BCD is they're over. That's 10, 20 years ago because there was little alternative. Today you can get uh, Cyber equipment from several uh, fantastic uh, manufacturers, and it's simply stupid to to try to attempt Cyber in in equipment that is not made for it. You will find out during the training that that you are holding yourself back by using equipment that is not suitable for for this type of of diving. So yes, in in that aspect, yes, I think uh, if if there is somebody sitting out there looking. Uh, to do Simon, yes, you need to consider to 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 get your own equipment, and it should be a dedicated uh, side mount system, definitely. Miko, if I was to buy it, go out and buy myself a side mount harness now, without you know going into a particular particular brand, what what kind of things would I look for in a good in a good side mount system? Well, it depends. Uh, um, I think the the roughness is for, for me at least uh, uh, one big thing that I comes. I like I don't like the the, the the bladder to be separate from the harness. I, I I prefer it to be just one one unit. It makes it easier to to clip on and uh, especially for side mount CCR it needs to be quite solid the whole system so you can clip on heavy equipment to it. This one is is something that I I try uh, I prioritize in uh, selecting. Um, other than that, the quality quality for sure you need to check that the that it's a it's, it's a the quality, quality, and um, uh, uh, um, setting thing about all systems at the moment on the market. If you if you want to, if you're doing open sea side mounting with with dry suit uh, with uh, with wetsuit, for example, so you can get your redundant bladder bladder in some of the systems. And uh, I would definitely leave the hybrids away. I would I would go for a for a dedicated. Uh, side mount for side mounting and then if I'm going to go back mount or single back mount blah, 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 I would go for a wing that is made for it okay and great. I want to go to the day rings and stuff that goes to, to detail but uh, talk to your talk to your dealer and uh, talk to your instructor and uh, this is how you get more information awesome okay so I have a little question we have from the people watching at home is you know the difference between diving with steel and aluminium tanks for side mount you know what, what, what are the big fundamental differences and, you know, what, what kind of environment should I use each, I guess? Also, the big, big difference is, is the buoyancy capacity of or the buoyancy characteristics of, of your tanks when they start to, to empty the steel tanks. There won't be any buoyancy change. The aluminium tanks, there will be a lot of buoyancy change. So I have to be honest, I have done a single cyclone dive in, in steel. So <laughs> the vast majority of my, uh, my experience come from aluminium tanks. Um, so if you come to Thailand, it is unlikely you're going you're gonna to be diving in steel. Uh, there's probably some steel tanks somewhere hidden somewhere, but we, we don't use them very often. So you'll be diving in aluminium, which I think is the, the best way to, to learn it, regardless of what you choose to do later. So if you are diving in an, an area where, where steel is the, the norm, 
even if you do your course in aluminium, you will learn extra skills. It's slightly more and, and do side mount in aluminium compared to doing it in steel. So if you learn in aluminium, it's much, much easier to convert back to steel than if you learn in steel and then have to convert to aluminium. Um, so, uh, but I have to be totally honest, I, I do pretty much all my dives in, in alu tanks. So uh, very little experience in side mount from steel. Nico, anything to add from you there? Well, for, I mean, um, I'm, I'm diving the side mount breather pretty much daily or um, um, most of my dives and uh, where we use steel tanks that's just for the oxygen <laughs> on your back or whatever. But I, I fully agree with, the, with Ivan, Ivan, what he said over there. I don't tend to use side mount configuration in cold waters with dry suits and heavy undergarments that much more, more as bailout tanks. And, but uh, yeah, I agree with Ivan. Yeah, no, I think um, the, the the environment you use it in is quite important with the side mount, isn't it? You know, if you're more di dry suit diving, you need a little bit of extra weight, then steel tanks help. With aluminium tanks, you need to think a little bit about how they're going to trim against your body. So they need slightly different positions on the harness and stuff like that. But like we said earlier, the best resource is probably your, your side mount instructor um, mm -hmm. and, 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 a, and a good solid sound mount course, right? Right um, on. So you guys are both uh, instructor trainers uh, for for XR in 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 Kotao in Thailand. How's the um, how's the instructor uh, development side of things uh, accessible in Thailand for people? So can somebody just rock up and become want to become a tech instructor, and you guys take them from let's say open water diver all the way through, or is they they need to have some kind of diving background in place? What what's the process? No, the door is open for anybody who has interest. So if, if your level at the moment is open water and your your dream or your goal is to become a technical instructor, you have some way in front of you. I think we, we can all agree on that. But, but if if an open water diver or non-diver came up to me and say, hey, this is my goal. I want to become a technical dive instructor. I would be happy to uh, to make a, a path how we could do that. It's not something we're going to do in a weekend, obviously. It will take a lot of time, but it's possible. The vast majority of the customers that, that I personally have I dealt with on the XI instructor side, they're obviously already uh, SSI instructors. They've been they've been in the industry for usually more than a year before they, they start to get an interest in, in teaching uh, side mount, but uh, sorry, it's teaching technical diving. But it shouldn't stop anybody. If your dream is to become a technical instructor and you're just an open water now, yeah, you have a year or two in front of you, but it's it's definitely possible. And what, what good preparation do you think somebody should do, Miko? If they're thinking about, you know, they're, they're maybe sitting there as a dive master or similar, and they're thinking they'd like to be a technical instructor in the future, what kind of preparation do you think they should do? Well, I think, I think the, uh, start with the theory and go through, through all, all, the, all your, all your uh, science of uh, diving theory first, so you, so you know what, you, what you're doing for the course. And, and uh, then for diving wise, definitely, um, uh, your, you need to fine tune your skills. They need to be spot on, and because uh, you're you're putting yourself in the next next level by showing showing skills to uh, new divers. And uh, so I would I would I would put a lot of effort on the diving skills and uh, just making sure that everything is everything is uh, fine tuned before before you join the join the class. And experience, I think, is a great thing, isn't it? You know, trying to get as many dives under your belt at the of level course. of diver you yeah. want to teach at, yeah. That would come naturally as do a lot of diving before. Also, awesome. we got a question from the from the group. What are your guys' opinion about teaching open water course on side mount? Well, I've never done it, you know, because we, we, at the moment is that standard doesn't really allow us. Um, I, I'm a side mount fanatic. It's no secret. I'm 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 really happy for side mount. I think it might be a bit of a challenge to to teach a non diver. I think it's easier to get the basics with just one tank, a, a more simple PCD that doesn't require the same amount of uh, setup as, as a, a learning side mount I would need to do. So I think it would be fun to, to teach a, a non-diver and start in side mount, but I think it's probably easier and to, to do the open water course. In, a bit too much, yeah, for in, a start. In, in more standardized equipment or more simple equipment. And then as soon as you have your certification, you can start to, to look into side mount. I, I don't misunderstand me. I encourage everybody to start side mount as early as possible. 
but I think it's probably easier to learn basic scuba diving on a back mounted set. Anything to add, Miko? No, I, I think I think uh, uh, the basic basic of diving the entry level should be done in a in a as simple as possible configuration. Um, I think uh, sideman would be a little bit too much. It's a, it's, a, it's a, there's a lot of personalizing in in the course to get the trim right, and and uh, it, it is not as simple packet package as a as a single back mount uh, uh, jacket wing, but. Uh, but with the, with the long hose and uh, with the wing uh, uh, on your back instead of the jacket mount uh, jacket uh, BCD, that's another thing. Uh, uh, and that's a, that's a, there you are introduced already to the long hose and uh, and uh, and a little bit different buoyancy device. So that that is something that uh, I would encourage. But I wouldn't I wouldn't do the the entry level your first try. It could be too much, and then you, you might end up not liking the whole sport just because it's it's a bit too much to take in. Uh, at the same time, so do your do your entry level with the, with the single single back mount, either wing, either with or without the long hose, but save the side mount later when your when your diving skills and uh, are already there, so you don't have to take it in all. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, guys, can you give me two suggestions for people looking to get into technical diving or side mount diving? So maybe maybe me, Co, you do the side mount diving, and Ivan, you do the technical diving. So people who are looking to get into it as a diver, what, what kind of things should they be looking for? I'd say for, for side mount, side mounting, like a, it's quite common, people think that it's only for cave diving. You don't. It's it's for it's for open water diving too. It has lots of lots of, lots of benefits, like the, like the trim and the safe to see your valves and stuff. So so um, don't think of side mount. Uh, starting side mount diving as that you should then go into the cavern and caves that is not necessary that that is hell of a hell of a different uh, ball game becoming a cave diver than side mount diving so I would uh, lower the expectations of the, the side mounting it's it's a it's a uh, it's a tool that is it's much more safe to use than uh, than a back mount or a single back mount so um, yeah just step in and uh, <laughs> get yourself in the course and Ivan, for XR divers, people looking to move from the recreational side of the career path into the XR side of the career path, what kind of what kind of suggestions do you have for those people? Well, uh, so I have a lot to be honest. Uh, do it as early as you can. So the 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 prerequisite for the XR courses are twenty four dives, uh, nitrous and deep. So as soon as you have that, uh, look into technical diving. Also, be realistic. Technical diving is different. Uh, it's very likely that when you do your technical course that you will find specific skills or some part of the, the, the academic uh, even more challenging. So the more practice you can do before, uh, as an example, if you're not sure you wanna, when you want to do your technical diving, you could go and buy the manual now. You can go to SSI, you can contact your, your dive center and you can get the, the XR manual and that gives you, as long as you like to, to study and to the, when it comes to practice, there is also the, 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 the performance requirements on a, a technical course will be for most divers will be much higher than they have been used to for their recreational diving. But we have some introductory course in SSI as an example, the XR Foundation, it's a great course. If you are not sure if you are ready for technical diving, but you do have the wish to, to become a technical diver, find an XR Foundation instructor, go and spend some time with, with him or her, uh, the XR Foundation course is a hands-on course. There's no theory. It's it's equipment-based. It's it's skill-based, and you will spend hours in the water with your instructor, and that will give yourself and your your chosen instructor a very good insight into if you are ready to to start to learn these uh, slightly more uh, complex skills. So be realistic. Technical diving is not you're not going to become a technical diver in 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 a weekend. It takes a lot of effort. It's also slightly costly. Um, but the more training you can do before, both academically, read the manuals, uh, do a, a foundation course, and finally think about the equipment that you will need. So as we talked about before, it's getting more and more common today to be able to rent uh, sideman equipment all over the, 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 the industry, but renting a full set of technical equipment is still tricky. So I highly encourage people to think about that when they, they start to put in the budget, you should budget to get your own equipment. Being a technical diver in rental equipment, it's it's not the best way to do it. 
I agree. I agree with you 100%. I think, you know, there is some, if you must travel super light luggage, then there's some, you know, there's some reason to hire small parts, but having your own fitted total diamond system is, is mm. the only way to learn. Um, another question on here. We have somebody who asks, um, I want to become a technical diver. Is it possible when you're over 40? Um, obviously, you guys are super old already, <laughs> over 40. So is it possible to still be a technical diver? What do you reckon? Yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure. There's some, there's some, uh, you need to, you need to have your uh, medical check, uh, check done annually, if I remember correctly. But uh, as long as you're, you're fit, uh, uh, it's, it's totally all right to be. I mean, most, most of the tech time. I hope I so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> now we've got another question. Have you guys got any experience teaching the uh, the open water course in a uh, long hose configuration? I know you talked about it a little bit there. Um, there's some people just asking a little bit more detail on that is that something that you guys do on a regular basis do your dive center offer it and uh, do you find it easier or any more challenging than teaching with a standard uh, regular regulated configuration I, I teach all my open border courses in a long hose but i don't teach very many open border courses i think <laughs> last year i did two or three or something like that but when i do it yes i i, I use a wing and i use a configuration with long and, and short holes um Obviously, like anything else, if you're used to using uh, the primary and the, and the alternative uh, air source, adapting to the short and long holes will take you maybe one or two confined sessions to get into it. But it's not more difficult to use a long hose. Many of the skills with some experience, it's much, much easier to use uh, the long hose. There's a reason you won't see technical divers diving around with, with primary alternatives because it doesn't work in the environment. So. Uh, no, I, I would say if there are sitting instructors out there who are considering adapting a wing and long and short hose, just do it. it. It's really, really not that difficult. And go speak to your manager, the owner of the dive center. All you really need to invest in is, is a few extra hoses. You already got the regulators first and second stages just at a, a bit of a long hose. So if there's somebody thinking about doing that, I think they should do it as, as soon as possible. It is a better way than, than the more traditional uh, with the primary alternative air hose. I have to agree to you. Miko, anything to add there? No, not, not really. As a shop owner, uh, it's, it's great to teach. Um, I'm, I'm still using the, the, the jacket BCD, BCDs, but uh, uh, it's a great benefit for shop owners to use wings because you only have to buy one size fits all. <laughs> but That's, how that, I do it. That's how I did it my center. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's really cool. So, guys, for the future, where do you where do you want to see your diving take you? So, destination wise and kind of more more self personal development wise, where do you, where does your diving you want to see your diving take you in the future, Ivan? Well, destination wise, I've always had two places that I've been fascinated, and that would be Greenland and Antarctica. So that's two the opposite poles, North and South poles. I I don't know why, but but I need to dive. Uh, preferable both places before I'm, I'm done. I would like to see uh, the Greenland shark. It's a shark that lives to, I don't know, three, four, and 500 years. And it's it's always fascinated me since I heard about it. So it, geographically, ice cold, Arctic water is definitely something uh, that I want to try. Um, and what was the second part? Second question was like personally, where do you, where did you want your diving to take you, you know, your, your personal kind of life and your, your career? Well, I, I, I would love to introduce even more people to, to, to this form of, of diving. So I would like to see in the future even more people interested in technical diving, cave diving and, and that sort. Uh, both myself and Miko is looking into the, the more advanced uh, rescue training. So we, we have some experience from, from the time wrong and maybe work in that direction. So setting up um, dedicated uh, dive rescue teams, uh, where we live in in thailand so that's another more personal thing that i would like to get introduced to and and do more with would be to the, the emergency rescue diving yeah and i know you guys are opening up the logistics of cave diving on the mainland as well to make it easier to move backwards and forwards to get airfields and that kind of stuff so you know that sounds like a really cool project that you're going to be involved in miko okay. from your side you know uh, uh, what, what, what's, your, what's your plans for the future more projects. That's that's pretty much it from on, on my side. I mean, uh, really, really want to want to use all my skill set in uh, in any kind of in, uh, environment. And uh, um, uh, it looks good at the moment. We uh, um, 
also, also 3D mapping is something that I've taken over lately. It's, it's harder than I thought, but we're trying to, I'm trying to learn it uh, every day. I go out there and, and try to do better, better with it. Uh, it's just taking pictures, heaps of thousands of pictures of, of, from a wreck, for example, and then overlapping the software will overlap them and then creating the software will create you a, a 3D image of a wreck. And this way you can, you can survey and you can save the, the wreck as it is into the smallest detail to the generations to come. Uh, I started it uh, over a year ago, but I suck in it. Uh, it's just turned out to be much more harder than I think. And uh, I'm still learning. <laughs> I should really get a good instructor here, but uh, that's something that I want for my projects. I mean, next next, next bigger project that we have, we're doing is, uh, is the USS Lagarto submarine that, that we find or Trident team, Jamie McLeod and Stuart Owen find it 15 years ago from here. And uh, now with the new technology, we are returning to it when this pandemic is over and uh, the plan is to 3D map the whole submarine and send it to Wisconsin and US Navy to with the new data so they can they can um, uh, then study it and and keep it for for the next generations and uh, that kind of projects there's lined up there's more submarines US submarines that we are supposed to do in the future and uh, and we got an awesome team team together doing it actually everybody is welcome pretty much but uh, this kind of thing and uh, and the ultimate where I see myself in about five years is inside a submarine that's that's pretty much what i want from diving <laughs> Kohler and the guys they have all submarines and the submarine captains and i happen to know a few now but i just need to get my own but that'll be <laughs> that'll be my ultimate goal now it sounds like you guys got some fantastic plans just remember you know i'm your friend you got my contact details and i can be there in a couple of hours all right okay. all right <laughs> yeah. so, so guys, we've, we've been talking now for like an hour and 10 minutes. It's been really cool to talk to you. Um, I, you know, I haven't seen you guys for kind of like half a year. So it's a bit of a bit of a shame. Hopefully you get to meet up soon when this is over. I'll come and visit you guys yeah. and have a beer together. Um, and, I, you know, hopefully maybe we can get you guys on another talk to talk about another so, uh, topic of the very interesting diving that you do. Um, so thank you very much for your time, guys. Um, all the best wishes for Corona. Keep yourself safe. Is there anything just finally you'd like to say to everybody who's come to watch you? Stay insane. Stay inside. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Stay inside. Stay safe and uh, wash those hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Adam. Nice to meet you. See you Later. later, guys. Thank you, Dave. Bye, bye.